All right, good morning, Doug. We are back with uh, questions from viewers and members of the file. First question, Doug, uh, they ask if you have any book recommendations on the French Revolution. Well, at the uh, 200th anniversary of the French Revolution, I read a book called Citizens by Simon Schama, who is apparently a famous historian, but I found it fairly worthless. Uh, and I read another book on the French Revolution. I forget the author. Uh, the problem is that so many of these, and it's smart to ask for a good for a recommendation, because uh, it's like Pareto's law basically says 80% of everything is crap, and it's true. Um, so you don't want to waste your time reading something that's not worth reading. Um, the problem with most history books is they'll recount the facts, but what I'm looking for a historian who's got vast array of knowledge and presumably has thought about these things, which I want an interpretation of, of what's going on. And most of these historians, I don't even care if it's a, a wrong interpretation because I'll decide based on whether it's right or wrong. But I'd like to know what the conclusion the guy uh, has about, uh, uh, about things. So I have not read what is, in my opinion, a good uh, history of the French Revolution. And I desperately like one. Mm. But that's what I'm looking for when I when I, when I search for one. And uh, oh, one other thing I can mention about the French Revolution is that um, uh, who was it that asked Joe and Lai, who was Mao's number two guy, uh, way back when? Uh, was it Charles de Gaulle? Who knows? But uh, he asked Joe, he asked Joe what. Uh, What's the meaning of the French Revolution? What do you think about it? And Joe said, it's too early to tell. <laughs> Good answer. I read recently, just in the last week, uh, a book, a very short book called Fiat Money Inflation in France. And it's By basically- Andrew White. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was very interesting. I had no idea about the inflation problem that happened during all the, during basically 1790 to like 1795. I had no idea. What did you think of that? Uh, I thought it was very well, very worthwhile reading. And I think it's interesting that uh, if you look at the, what was going on in France after 1789 and before Napoleon took over, uh, everything went wrong that could have gone wrong. I mean, they totally overturned uh, the old regime, they renamed the months of the year. Uh, you know, the Jacobins were trying to actually overturn the entire nature of society, in addition to killing 30,000 people, they estimate, by guillotine. That's a lot of people, uh, even in today's world, but populations were lower then. Uh, and fighting wars against foreign countries. All this was going on. And still, France survived. So, you know, despite how turbulent things will be here in uh, the US and Europe over the next 10 years, well, maybe it'll survive. France survived the revolution. But they got, they got Napoleon out of it. Yeah, well, that was kind of a mixed blessing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. And the biggest thing I, I, I that he draws your attention to, the reader, is that the people who were actually in charge of the government at the time were not like a bunch of like our leaders who like don't know anything, aren't really present, you know, don't aren't educated, don't are not of sound mind. They were really smart people. And so the debate around whether or not to issue money was like a really sophisticated, thoughtful debate. And it just kind of came down to a a small vote, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Those people were well-educated and thoughtful. They had a totally wrong philosophy, but the people we've got running the government today have a totally wrong philosophy, and they're 
ignorant in addition. So it absolutely can't end well. Okay. Uh, next question. Why, why does virtually everyone, including you folks, when referring to US Gov, call it a democracy? Only the word republic is ever stated in the constitution. Never once is the word democracy mentioned. I didn't know that we called the US, I, I've never called the US a democracy. I think when I refer to it, I refer to it, I have a dry sarcasm. I say democracy, almost in air quotes, democracy, you know, spreading democracy. You know, I, I talk about it like that, but yeah, I don't. No, no, so that's incorrect anyway. Democracy, even republic. Listen, a republic, so you get, it's not direct control the way the Greeks had. That was a democracy in Athens. And republic is like in Rome. And so how's that, how's a republic any better anyway, where you have representatives get up there? So, no, I, I throw all that out. Listen, around here, we're anarcho-capitalists. We don't believe in the state, whether it's a democracy or a republic or a dictatorship or whatever other kind of goofy state you want. That's the whole point of being an anarcho-capitalist, which is actually the most, if you like democracy, it's actually the most democratic uh, type of thing where you, you control yourself and you vote with your dollars, exactly. if you will. All right, next question is, Doug, do you test your gold coins, you know, using an eddy current conductivity measurement or something like that to know that they're real gold? No. No, I don't. Uh, there are little devices where you can put a gold coin in there to see, you know, the different gold coins, whether it's the right size and thickness, and then you weigh it. Uh, but what's the real risk with gold coins? I don't think there really is one, frankly. Uh, there might be a risk if you buy a, um, a one kilo bar because, you know, clever people might um, have melted down tungsten, which is the same specific gravity as gold, uh, and therefore can pass that test and then coat it with gold. I don't think that really happens much. I've never encountered it or known anybody else in the business that's encountered phony gold coins. So, um, I mean, that's a good question. That's a good question. And as the higher gold goes, there are gonna be clever fraudsters. It'll probably do it. it might be worth their while, but uh, no personal experience, I guess, Maybe I'm naive, but I'm not terribly worried about it. Okay. Uh, next question is, in a recent Q&A or talk, I heard Doug mention that in the occurrence of a metals bull market, that he would sell off his mining stock holdings. Um, so given Doug's long history in the precious metal space and with metals on the move up, would Doug consider giving us a warning when to start selling? Because uh, I'm beginning to like my portfolio again, but like the old song goes, you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. Specifically, he's referring to you said, well, I expect one more bull market. And after that, I'm going to be done with it. I'm just going to, you know, buy something else. Something, something sensible, a business that's growing and pays a dividend and that I don't have to worry about much. Um, everybody's looking for the next Berkshire Hathaway, obviously. Uh Okay, uh, I think the bull market in gold, we've been saying this for some time, has started. In fact, as we speak today, I looked and uh, gold's had a new uh, all-time nominal high. Hmm. I think 243, if I recall, something like that. Hmm. So it's up like, well, that's a good, that, that's, that's a good move, 40 bucks okay. in the last few days. Something yeah, like it was, that. It was, I mean, wasn't it 1900 back in November? I mean, it's really moved quite a bit. Yeah, it's 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 on the way. So uh, we've got a gold bull market, and the gold stocks aren't really moving. They are moving. I mean, they're moving up a skosh, a little here, a little there. But the uh, 
but the big funds, uh, pension funds, and these BlackRock people and mutual funds and this type of thing, they're not in the gold stocks yet for all kinds of reasons that we've discussed. You know, gold is, a, well, entirely apart from the fact that the powers that be still don't believe in gold. At least the powers that be here in the West don't believe in gold. So uh, the gold stocks are really, really cheap right now. I mean, some of them are actually at giveaway levels. And I'm not talking about <clears throat> the explorers or the developers, I'm talking about actual producers. So, uh, and it's usually the quality that moves first. Hmm. So, yeah, I think we're moving into a gold bull market. And do I think it's the last one? Yeah, I kind of do. And the reason is because all these central banks realize they can't trust each other's currencies. They don't want to hold each other's fiat funny money. Uh, and they really can't trade with each other effectively with uh, monopoly money. The Chinese and the Russians trading their monopoly money back and forth. They have no reason to trust each other. There won't be a BRICS currency. Yeah, I think we're going to go back to actual gold, gold, gold. And hopefully it won't be a gold backed currency. Cut out the middleman. What do you need a currency for? You use gold. Gold. That's what you use. I mean, if gold is remonetized, what, what, like, what would the value of gold be? I mean, obviously, it's re I understand it's based in dollars, but like, just to give a sense of perspective, what would it take if, in today's dollars, what would a remonetization of gold get the gold price to? It seems like it would be insane. Yeah, it'd be very high, I think, because. Um, how many dollars are in existence? I don't think anybody knows. I mean, you just look at the US. The US has been running a trade deficit now for about 40 years. And it's running at, uh, what, I don't know what it is going to be this year, 700, 800 billion dollars. And those are all dollars that basically go outside the US. Uh, or, or owned by foreigners. And if you're just going to redeem them outside the U.S. dollars owned by foreigners, uh, do the arithmetic. They, the U.S. government says they have, I think the number is 265 million ounces of gold in Fort Knox. So got to divide that into how many trillions of dollars and uh, you come up with a really big number. Forget about the domestic money supply. So I am uh, I feel pretty good. I don't like holding commodities that have run up a lot. But in real terms, keep in mind that uh, gold hit $850 an ounce back in 1980. In today's dollars, that's like yeah, $3,400, 3500 Dollars an ounce, who knows? Depends on who's inflate, whose figures you want to. So gold is moving up, but it's still only two-thirds of its previous, previous high. And this crisis that we're looking at now is going to be a lot worse and a lot scarier than the one back in 1980 was. So it's mm -hmm. going higher. I, I don't want to pick a figure, but it's going a lot higher. And I feel very comfortable holding my gold and very comfortable holding my gold stocks, which at some point uh, the fund managers and the public are going to get the bit in their teeth and it's going to run. Hmm. Okay. Um, next question is, how about, what do you think of Belize as a bug out location? Seems nice. Uh, their main problem, as I understand it, is lots of migration from Spanish speaking uh, Central American countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's funny, on a, on a Zoom group that we're on, we have a, a young, smart, well-connected guy from Belize. I'm gonna have to ask him exactly how he assesses it. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. Well, we'll have to come back to that one after I talk to uh, Nadir. Okay. All right, next question. In 2011, uh, the CME raised the margin requirements for gold in, in the middle of the night and gold collapsed. Does Doug think that they can do that again? 
<clears throat> yeah, but okay. Uh, that's on the futures exchanges. And yeah, it can work because forget about what, what happened uh, during the commodity boom of that time, 2011, that area. It really uh, happened back in um, 19, was it 1980? when the Hunt brothers were trying to quarter the silver market and they got themselves way over leveraged uh, on the futures exchange. And then the exchange uh, raised the margin tremendously and forced them to sell all of it. So silver collapsed from $50 back to, I don't know, I have to look at the chart, but a lot. So, uh, yeah, that can happen. But I don't know. I don't think it's a problem, as much of a problem now as it would have been back then. And the reason is that uh, now uh, you're not getting speculative buying from people on the futures exchanges. You're not getting speculative buying, buying in the West. It's mainly central banks that are buying, buying for cash and putting it away in their vaults. That's what's going on. And gold is flowing to the Orient at this point, not on futures exchanges, cash. So um, what happens on the futures market is indicative, but it's just not as important as it used to be. I think the nature of the market's changed. Okay. All right. Next question. Someone asked about uh, your view of property rights in Uruguay, you know, land, water, bank accounts, et cetera. I think they're excellent here in Uruguay, and they're actually very, very good in Argentina, too. I mean, owning a lot of real estate in both places, uh, I feel pretty secure uh, about it. I mean, at least as secure, at least as secure as I do owning real estate in the U.S. In fact, since the governments down here are much less crazy than they are than it is in the U.S. Uh, we don't have squatter problems here. Well, in Argentina, if you own a large piece of land and squatters stake out on your land and stay there for too long without you evicting them, yeah, you got a problem. But um, yeah, I feel pretty good about it. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I I feel pretty good about it, but I know I was just looking up some stats, and I found some website that ranked Uruguay in particular uh, number 29th out of 125 globally in property rights. That includes things like intellectual property as well. So, but basically, it's ranked it ranks at number one in Latin America in the Caribbean, but um, 29 overall. Interesting. How do they rank the U.S.? Are you looking at the list? Uh... Uh, let's see. They don't show me the top list like that. They just give me these bar charts. So it's a good question. I don't know. I have to. I would think. Do that kind of rank. I would think that Switzerland ranks close to number one for property rights. Although, yeah, like let's... you said, it's not just real property. It's intellectual property and bank accounts and all this type of thing. Yeah, it, this is this, this is all in PDF form. They don't they don't show it as a list, unfortunately, where I can sort. So I, I can't tell you where the U.S. ranks in here. But yeah, I mean, I I feel like the property rights here are pretty pretty solid. I mean, the big thing in Latin America is clear title to the property, and you know, in, in Uruguay, it's an extensive process to make sure that you have clear title at the at the point of purchase. So I don't know, I'm pretty confident in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much the same thing in Argentina. So, well, <clears throat> you know, it's funny. Uh, the reason that we're supposed to have a government is to secure property rights. But the greatest danger to your property rights everywhere in the world is not the entity that's supposed to secure them. It's the state. It's the government. Exactly. That's what you see with all these squatting problems that have become, you know, popular on social media now in the U.S. It's the government that protects those people. Yes, it does. Exactly. They come into your house and the government is what makes it impossible to uh, kick them out. 
I mean, if, honest, you hire a couple, if you hire a couple guys with baseball bats, tell them to go away, you're the one that's going to jail for kicking out of your house. Yeah, they've gotten pretty sophisticated, and they share all this stuff on social media. Like there was uh, apparently, if you you know you order an Amazon package to the house before you get there, so when the police come, you've got a, your address and your name on the package, and you can say, "No, uh -huh. no, I have a, I have a lease here, and I, you can't kick me out." Ah, oh, oh, that's clever. These, yeah, it, it, it's just amazing. Yeah, these migrants are are going to become a bigger and bigger problem as they you know, kind of groove into how to scam the system and get organized, which they'll do, and form their own mafias, which they'll do. It, we really, it's like Dracula. Dracula is not a danger unless you invite him into your house. You invite him into your house, you ask for it. And that's what's happening to the U.S. and Europe. 100%. All right. Uh, next question. He says, I was surprised to see Mexico and Uruguay on the Digital Nations Club in bed with the usual offenders. So the goals of the uh, this Digital Nations Club sound really legitimate. But as we learned over the last few years, it was all about surveillance and control. Are these countries prime candidates for central bank digital currency and total surveillance of population? My guess is that uh, Millet will put an end to that because he wants to destroy the central bank and therefore central bank digital, digital currencies would, would arise from it. Uh, and Uruguay, certainly the current president, is a pretty conservative guy. So, uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, you can't protect, predict what these governments are, are going to do. The answer to the question is try not to use them, even if everybody's using them and... Uh, keep building your uh, stash of gold coins. I mean, but I'm not, I'm not particularly worried about that in either Argentina or Uruguay. I'm much more worried about the U.S. and Europe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in in the, our last conversation, uh, it says that Doug mentions Argentina being a best citizenship. What about a worldwide tax system and its uh, citizenship that you can't renounce? So once you're a citizen, they can impose any law, a draft, or raise taxes to the moon. Well, I don't know if it's true that once you're an Argentine citizen, you can't renounce. I was unaware of that. I mean, if you've done some research and found out that that's true, that's interesting. But I don't think it's true. And do you know any Argentines who do are not subject to the worldwide tax reporting requirement? Well, if you live in Argentina, you're subject to tax on worldwide income. But just because you're an Argentine, it's not like being an American citizen. If you're an American citizen, you're taxed forever, even if you never come back to the U.S. And the, the problem is, the difference is, the U.S., is like a giant vampire squid all over the world. So if you break American laws, they can by hook or by crook, legally or illegally, get you anywhere in the world. But the Argentine government can't do that and wouldn't do that. I mean, that's so if you become an Argentine citizen and it's a good passport with lots of visa free travel, um, and you know, nobody, if anybody hijacks a plane, they might say, all the Americans over here, we're going to kill you. They're not going to say that about all the Argentines over here, we're going to kill you. So, uh, now the Argentine government is not a danger to you unless you're in Argentina. So, the smart way to do this is to um, become an Argentine citizen and then live in Uruguay, if you like the culture, which I do. Uh, or live someplace else. But mm -hmm. it's not like a U.S. passport, which is an act of liability from a tax point of view. Just right. don't live in the country if you don't like their taxes. Yeah. All right. Uh, Doug, have you ever looked at uh, Tasmania for living? I spent a week in Tasmania and mm -hmm. uh, drove all around the place. Um, and it's a delightful little island south of Australia, with uh, a climate that's uh, like that of Vancouver, I'd say, something on that order. Uh, 
Actually, uh, the only time I, I went diving in a kelp forest uh, was in Tasmania. So great place. I like it. Uh, it's kind of the end of the road. It's really the end of the road. <laughs> uh, but it's part of Australia. So uh, the Australian government is very problematical. All right. Um, let's see. Is there any news about Battle Bank? Well, I'm a reasonable sized shareholder in Battle Bank and have been for years now, which disturbs me. Uh, this is a good reason not to invest in private companies that you hope are going to go public. And forget about going public. The bank hasn't even opened. Meanwhile, they're burning money. Well, the good news is that most of Battle Bank is owned by, it's run by Frank Trotter, who's a very competent guy. And it's mostly owned by Rick Rule, who's also pretty competent. And he's got enough money in it that he's not going to let anything bad happen to his, he's going to keep throwing money at it until they, I don't know why they're not, clear to do business. That's I find that disturbing. I've got to ask one of those guys, you know, this is taking a lot longer than it should have. So what's the problem? So no I don't know. It's brutal yet, anyway. Hmm? What's that? There's no, basically it hasn't yet gotten its uh, FDIC approval at this point. They, they haven't opened their doors yet. It's been longer than it should be. So I've been remiss in not asking the boys, what's the problem? Is there a problem? Yeah. All right. Uh, do you think that it could be a good speculation to short NVIDIA at some point? I'm sure it is. I mean, it's. <laughs> I mean, it's got a parabolic uh, stock chart. It's worth what two trillion dollars now, something like that. But yeah. it's earning money, which is earning lots of money scores of billions. So it's not like these typical junk tech stocks where, you know, it's, uh, they're hoping to earn money, but they actually are. But the trouble with NVIDIA is um, uh, they make chips. And there are a lot of companies in the world that know how to make chips. And uh, it's a competitive business because it's so profitable. So I don't own NVIDIA, which I had owned it years ago, but uh, I'm not gonna buy it now. And I don't wanna short it now either because uh, you know it's dangerous to short these beam stocks. Yeah, especially when they have real revenue and earnings growth behind it. Yeah, I, it, it could, you know, because of, Competition. I mean, sure, it could drop 90%, but that's not a bet I want to make. Yeah. At least not now. Okay. All right. Uh, just a couple more questions. This guy says he's in talks with a company for a remote job. He says, if everything works out, uh, I want to move to a country with lower living costs. I've been thinking about Argentina, Greece, Crete, and possibly Sicily. Uh, any other places I should consider? Hmm. Well, I'm a big fan of the Orient, and I really like Thailand. Thailand's a great place to hang out. I mean, it, it really is a, it's a fantastic place to hang out. It really is, for lots of reasons. Culture's nice, food's excellent, weather's good. So if you can think of the Orient, you can think of that. Uh, and cost of living would be, probably better than most of these places. I think so. Yeah, because uh, I'm not even sure that uh, in in Crete or uh, Sicily, you know, you can, I think you can, you can hire a, a full-time maid or cook uh, if you want to do that uh, for a reasonable price, something you can't do in the U.S. or Canada unless you're really wealthy. Uh, you can do in Argentina, no problem. I mean, look, just today, uh, 
the prices are, are not getting out of control. In fact, the rate of inflation is dropping in Argentina. What Millet is doing is working. The rate of price increases per month are dropping, dropping, dropping. It's stabilizing. That's really one of the most important things that he can do. Um, but look, I just had a massage today. Uh, my masseur came to visit me. He's a good masseur too. Came to visit me here at the apartment. An hour massage. Uh, it cost me uh, 10,000. I've got to add a thousand to everything. It cost me 18,000 pesos, which is to say $18. Now, where can you get a good masseur to visit you and give you an hour massage for $18? Not many places. Thailand might be one of them. Thailand Thailand would be one of them, yeah. Yeah, but not many. In fact, my, my two favorite countries in the world have been for a long time and remain Argentina and Thailand, mm -hmm. which is odd because they're not only at the antipode, antipodes of each other through the globe, uh, totally, uh, but they're opposite in culture and every other way, but I like them both. All right. Okay, last question. What's your opinion of Michael Yan and his alarming videos that he's been posting about the migration issues? Well, he showed up on a, um, on a uh, Zoom call that I frequent uh, and it was very interesting and very disturbing to uh, hear him talk about what's going on at the border. Um, and I think he does good work. And I subscribe to his newsletter, but his newsletter only comes out very, very, very sporadically. So I'm not going to resubscribe. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm all for what he's doing, basically what he thinks. Uh, but he's yeah, he... kind of like a, I think he's just a one-trick pony watching the border. It's very good. It's important. But, you know, that's his, that's his drill. Yeah. Yeah. And he's definitely had some good stuff that's come out of it, but he also draws a lot of conclusions uh, about it that like he's, he's convinced that the, you know, the Chinese communist party, as he says, it is, you know, part of an, the part of the problem of what's happening with the migration effort. But then he also says the U S is funding it, but he also says the UN is doing it, you know? And so it's confused about exactly who is the enemy here and causing the trouble. But he points to these big, these totally unrelated entities. Maybe they all are, though. Maybe, maybe he's right. But they could all be in on it. Yeah. I don't know. He's an ex-soldier that likes to get boots on the ground and see what's happening. That's really good. But as far as his interpretation of, you know, who the puppet masters are in back of it, I don't know. I'm not sure he does either. Yeah, I definitely don't know. Yeah, it's good stuff though. I, 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 he has good stuff on Twitter. I definitely, it's worth worth checking him out if you aren't familiar with Michael Yan. Yeah, and I guess he's got stuff on YouTube too, doesn't he? Must. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen him on YouTube, but he does interviews from time to time on different with different people, and it's always like alarming. I mean, he always like scares the shit out of you. Yeah, of the, ab absolutely. The yeah, and I I think he's probably right. I think he is too about that. Yeah, yeah, he definitely was a way before it became at a level of public consciousness, this migration problem, he was way ahead of it. You know, talking about that it was coming all through this Darien Gap and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. quite quite amazing. The Darien Gap was supposed to be the, you know, the most brutal, hard to travel place in the whole world. And now it's just like a highway through the place. Where... Right. And I sent you something from this, uh, I don't know if you saw it. It's like some humanity migration humanitarian organization that was they were accusing Colombia and Panama of not respecting migrant rights as they were transiting across the uh, Darien Gap. I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah, yeah. My question is what what migrant rights if if these people, you know, are in Colombia and want to cross into Panama, uh well you know, if I was the Panamanian government, I wouldn't want a bunch of, you know, potentially dangerous people wandering through my country doing God knows what to the locals. Uh, they should be stopped at the border. Uh, you know, what are you doing here? 
How are you going to sustain yourself while you're in Panama? How are you going to get from point A to point B? You're, you're going to walk through the jungle? Well, you don't own that jungle. I mean, do you have permission from the owner to walk through it? It's probably the Panamanian government. And the answer is no, you don't. So yeah. you want to come to Panama? Fine. <clears throat> you can get a plane to Panama City and, you know, uh, stay in a hotel and eat in restaurants. And, and, and then the next question is, What's going on with all these countries? Then the next step is after Panama. What Costa Rica. They put them Costa on a bus Rica. and they transit them to Costa Rica. Yeah. What What the hell is the Costa Rican government doing? I mean, they've got a nice little country. Do you want all these migrants wandering through your country? Uh, you know, they can only steal stuff and make trouble and they don't bring anything. So who's inviting them in? And, and then Mexico. Why is Mexico? This is... This is all crazy. And what's the U.S. government? Do you think that you think the uh, U.S. government would talk to these countries and say, hey, uh, listen, this is this is we don't consider this an act of friendship that you're facilitating this nonsense. And of course, since the U.S. welcomes them and pays them to get here. Well, I guess that answers the question. Yeah, it's outrageous. And you see the, the amount of international collaboration on the whole exercise that makes it all happen. No one enforcing borders and them setting up these transit points in Panama. And that article is specifically shipping them to Costa Rica, just making, you know, they got to make it through the, for some reason, they make them go through the Darien Gap. They make them walk that part. But after that, they shuttle them up for the north. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very funny. Well, since they all have cell phones and they're all happily ensconced in the U S uh, they're all calling their buddies all around the world from wherever they come from. Say, come on over. This is great. You don't have to live like a, a refugee in Nigeria. Come on over here and live off the fat of the land in the U.S. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with the U.S. that 50 million Nigerian migrants can't cure. And that will only be a quarter of the population of that country. And there's plenty more. Oh, shit. Crazy to imagine, but it's happening in real time yeah. right before us. It, it is. God, it's going to be so interesting to see how this all sorts out, uh, kind of, in 10 years. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Difficult, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. I... All right. Well, we'll leave it there for today, Doug. Have a great weekend. We'll, we'll talk to you next week. Great, Matt. Thanks.